Perhaps nothing in Chicago is more recognizable than its public transportation, specifically the Chicago L. Its sheer size made that inevitable. Today, just its train system has 720,000 riders per weekday and 235 million rides per year. And although this system didn't appear overnight, it needed to rise fast. As since its incorporation by the state of Illinois in 1837, Chicago became one of the fastest growing cities in the country by the end of the century. And because of the city's expansive sprawl and growing population, something needed to be done to transport its citizens in an efficient and timely manner. The metropolis began to sow the seed of their public transportation system with the horse-drawn streetcar lines on State and Randolph Streets in 1859. Over the decades, the system of these streetcars grew, upgrading from animal power to mechanical and eventually electric when the first railway opened. This line was birthed the Chicago L. But what you might not know is that over its growth of 125 years, the rail system had several lines closed, their stations abandoned and demolished, gutting this network to less than half of its original size. And if you're wondering what remains, join me as today we discover Chicago's abandoned L stops. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The first railway line in Chicago ran on May the 28th, 1892, from Congress to 39th Street. Rather than being the public service as we know it today, it was privately owned by the Chicago and Southside Rapid Transit Company, which was incorporated in 1888. The first L train was a collection of green and yellow coaches called the Alley L because the route was completely through city-owned alleys. At first, the public objected to the unsightly railway tracks through the city, but made peace once they realized the 34-block trip could now be made in only 10 minutes. Imagine how much time that saved people. For example, instead of spending the entire day traveling across the city, people can now spend time on things like chores, Cooking, for example, a timeless art that has existed for centuries. But with today's sponsor, the worry about cooking is now history as well. You see, Cook Unity is the first chef to consumer platform delivering freshly prepared, pre selected meals right to your door weekly. Connecting a diverse group of talented chefs who cook delicious, inventive, fresh meals every day in regional micro kitchens, not warehouses or production facilities. In other words, you can basically enjoy a wide variety with the convenience of not needing to cook, but the integrity of a homemade meal. It's like you have your own personal chef who prepares meals using real, organic ingredients, humanely raised meats, and nothing artificial. Another convincing feature is that the subscription is flexible. You can pause, skip weeks, or cancel at any time. Cook Unity chefs offer up a wide range of meals with over seven different dietary preference filters, including vegan, paleo, and gluten-free options. The meals are delivered fully cooked, so all you have to do is heat them up. No more cleanup or meal planning. In fact, I just got done enjoying lamb curry meatballs with lentils made by Chef Michael Williams of my hometown, Chicago, and it was phenomenal. Chef Williams is the owner of six popular restaurants and a seventh on the way. I was delighted by the impactful taste, but it was the more subtle effect of quality ingredients that really made Cook Unity stand out. So don't miss out. Go to cookunity.com history50 or click the link in the description below and use my code history50 to get 50% off your first order of Cook Unity meals and try them out for yourself. Once the LEL was up and running, rail lines took off, with more and more companies sticking their hand into the pot, such as the Lake Street Elevated Railroad Company, the Metropolitan Westside Elevated Railroad Company, the Union Elevated Railroad Company, and the Northwestern Elevated Railroad Company. By 1909, they had built the infrastructure for many of Chicago's rail lines, able to serve large swaths of the city's outskirts and neighborhoods, so with all their goals aligned, the companies merged into the Chicago Rapid Transit Company, or CRT, 
1924. But after going to the trouble of unifying and connecting their lines to each other, the company experienced a slew of financial problems in the early 20th century. CRT simply couldn't generate enough revenue to outweigh its cost of operation while expanding into the city's growing suburbs at the same time. It was a balancing act that they couldn't keep up with, so by the end of World War II, they knew what needed to be done. In 1945, the Illinois General Assembly created the Chicago Transportation Authority and bought all of CRT's assets. By October of 1947, they were running the L and beginning to see why the CRT was having so many problems. With over 200 miles of track, 5,000 trains, 227 stations, plenty of Chicago was covered by the L, if not smothered by it. People could get anywhere they needed to go if they could navigate the complex schedule of express and local services, often running on the same tracks and getting in each other's way. Alternatively, they could take other easier methods of transit like buses, streetcars, and expressways. At this phase of the story, CRT never abandoned or closed a single station. They just kept building more and more. You couldn't modify any part of the schedule without affecting the rest. It was a mess. All of this contributed to the reduction in ridership and revenue that CRT was seeing. However, with the rise of the automobile, the superhighway, and the exodus from the city to the suburbs, the city's operating authority began to take some drastic measures. They closed scores of stations and discontinued seven lines and branches. And they didn't just discontinue them, they demolished the physical infrastructure of these stations. Only a few remnants of these stations remain today, but they have made the way for the L to become the second largest and second busiest railway system in the US, even with half of the original size. So now that we have the context, let's have a look at what's been left behind. The Wells Street Terminal was always part of the plan for the West Side Metropolitan Elevated Railway, or the MET, but the price to build such a terminal was too high for the then L owners, so they built a smaller one nearby on Franklin Street. Upon opening, all MET trains on the loop were routed there, but the Franklin Terminal operated for just three years before plans for the terminal proper arose. It was shut down and demolished in 1897. In 1902, the city council granted the MET approval to build a four-track terminal at Fifth Avenue, and on October the 3rd, 1904, Well Street, known then as Fifth Avenue Terminal, opened. It was built to the tune of $1 million with one-story housing concessions, ticket agents, and stairs to platforms. The terminal quickly became a station for rush hour trains, newspaper trains, and surprisingly, an end for the Aurora, Elgin, and Chicago interurban line. In 1906, Fifth Avenue was renamed to Wells Street and the terminal followed suit. Things were going well for Wells Street. A little too well, perhaps, for in the 1920s, ridership on the L reached its peak, pushing the terminal to its limits. And hence, once the L lines were unified, the CRT got to work on expanding Well Street Terminal, building a new three-story structure in April of 1926. It was an elaborate showpiece, displaying a terracotta exterior, a marble, bronze, and ivory interior, and a lavish lobby and waiting room for passengers. Imagine that for an L stop. The expansion only cost $160,000 and also allowed them to extend the island to handle eight car trains instead of the previous five. Well Street was now equipped to handle more action, receiving about 18 trains an hour during the afternoon rush. During the rush, trains would depart and arrive within seconds of one another requiring precise scheduling and choreography to pull it off. When the CTA took over in 1947, service to the Well Street Terminal was decreased as operation was revised. The CTA didn't see a future for stub terminals in their new rapid transit system, and the opening of new CTA-oriented stations didn't help its case. So on February the 25th, 1951, trains were rerouted from the terminal leaving only Garfield and Douglas services stopping there. But just a few months later, all services were withdrawn from Well Street 
as the new AB skip stop service began to be implemented with the construction of the Congress Expressway and the old interurban lines pulling out the terminal was closed for good on September the 20th 1953 Well Street terminal was abandoned for a few years with the hope that it could be connected to the new Congress line but another newly constructed station put an end to that altogether in 1955, the two top floors of the terminal were removed. In the end, Wells Street Terminal became a place of emergency train storage before it was finally demolished in August of 1964. The only remnant of the Wells Street Terminal is an unusual gap on the street of the same name. A parking garage lies where it once stood, set back from the sidewalk. Next up, we have the Lost Douglas Park Station. Built as one of seven stations extending the Douglas Park branch in 1902, as the name suggests, the L was always supposed to reach this location. Originally intended to connect with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad, it intersected. Indeed, early plans had a second set of exit doors leading to the CB and Q Douglas Park Station, which was built, but these plans were scrapped, causing the station to be set up high above the railroad below. As a result, it and the track are elevated very high, with two stories, so the ticket agent and the waiting room are on the same level as the rails. Despite being built of the same materials as the other stations on the line, pressed brick and rusticated stone, Douglas Park Station was architecturally unique. Passengers could reach the second level by a set of entrance stairs at the front of the building. The exterior of the first story was limestone with pressed brick above sills of stone and cast concrete. At the tracks, the dual-sided platforms had canopies with iron frames, with lattice supports and railings, with stylized diamond designs. It even had an early type of escalator to get passengers up to the trains. But like all other stations, mismanagement by the CRT caused it to lose ridership, and by the time the CTA gained control, it looked perfect for cutting. In 1948, they tested out a new type of operation, the AB Skip Stop Service. Trains and stations would be labeled A, B, or All Stops, and trains would only stop at stations with the same lettering unless it was an All Stop Service. This, combined with the closure of low traffic stations, greatly sped up the rapid transit system, but unfortunately, Douglas Park was soon to be lost forever. On December the 9th, 1951, the Douglas Park branch was revised into a skip-stop service, closing five stations and converting another three. Roosevelt, Wood, and Douglas Park were converted into partial service stations. Partial service stations had no staff, no ticket agent on duty, and entrance was only via token-operated turnstiles. But even this half-life couldn't justify its existence. So on May the 3rd, 1952, Douglas Park was closed and later demolished. Another lost station was the Main Street Station, established on March the 28th, 1925. Along with the Nile Center branch it sat on, it was built as a part of the North Shore and Milwaukee Railroad's Skokie Valley Route and the local L trains. It was a high-speed bypass for the interurban line around the more congested north side suburbs, but the North Shore line never ended up using the stop. Main Street Station's architecture was an interesting blend of prairie school and vernacular bungalow, which was popular at the time. It had intricate eaves and low-pitched roofs while having textured exterior brickwork and exposed rafters. It looked very similar to other stations on the Nile Center branch it sat on, with one exception perhaps. You see, rather than being raised to meet the elevated platform of tracks, Main Street was on ground level. So the station's platform and canopy were separate structures, unlike other stations with a short set of stairs bringing passengers up onto the island platform. But this unique station would almost never be used, as within just a few years of its creation, the Great Depression hit. New construction in the suburbs came to a halt, and the surrounding area by the station remained vacant, even though it was already subdivided with roads and sidewalks. Further development of the branch wasn't possible after the Depression, 
because World War II came soon after. So by the time the branch came into the CTA's hands, they saw one of the lowest ridden and least economical lines in the entire system. It was an easy line to prune, and the opportunity presented itself when the North Shore line workers went on strike on March the 27th, 1948, as the understaffed stations of the branch wouldn't run. So the CTA seized that moment and shut them down altogether. And in the end, bus number 97 replaced the Nile Center branch service. Now we should point out that the North Shore Line continued to operate on the Skokie Valley route, but didn't provide much service to Main Street, which remained abandoned. But when the North Shore Milwaukee Railroad ceased operations on January the 21st, 1963, the CTA began to look into ways to convert the Skokie Valley Line into a rapid transit network. The solution was to turn it into a non-stop shuttle between Howard and Dempster, which opened on April the 20th, 1964. And hence Main Street Station was demolished that same year with no one seeming to have any need for it. Ravenswood Station was opened along with the construction of the Ravenswood Branch, which was placed into service on May the 18th, 1907. It was a station typical of the elevated houses built for the branch, except for its location. Rather than being placed at the crossing of two streets, it was erected in the middle of a block. This was most likely done as a traffic generation method because of its proximity to the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. However, Ravenswood was later relocated two blocks north between Leland and Lawrence, built as a traditional station. Ravenswood Station was made with dark brick and simple ornamentation around the cornice, belt rail, and in the hood of the front entrance. The doors had multi-panel windows and interiors, which were covered in glazed bricks. A large, bracketed wood beam ran across the width of the interior in the center, giving it a craftsman-like influence. The original canopy was gently curved with latticed support columns, while the platforms were made with flat panels, thick balustrades, and sunflower rosettas. Although Ravenswood survived the initial CTA takeover, it became one of 23 stations closed and eventually demolished in the North-South Service revision on August the 1st, 1949. This revision included the AB skip stop concept, which didn't work with stations like Ravenswood that were only suited to local service due to how low the traffic was. However, the story on branches like the Stockyard branch, well, they were very different. After the railway got its start in Chicago, many L lines and extensions were built to serve new housing developments and business districts. The Stockyards branch, built in 1908, is unique in serving just one industry, meatpacking. There were few actual streets in the stockyards, instead being covered in a web of rails, troves of roaming cattle, and many loading docks. This is because the network of rail lines were originally constructed by the Union Stockyards and Transit Company to serve the 320-acre Chicago stockyards that they built in 1865. Their purpose was intended only for moving freight, but by 1882, the passenger service was up and running. The branch ended in a single-track counterclockwise loop around Packingtown. The section of the yard where most of the companies that operate there had their meat packing plants. These plants were owned by Morris & Company, Swift & Company, and Armour & Company who had stations along the branch named after them. The stations had single-sided platforms with peaked canopies and mezzanine station houses, all of which were built on a conventional street elevated structure. On its first day of operation, 25,000 people rode the line, either out of necessity or curiosity. From there, the stockyards grew into a center of American meatpacking, even becoming one of America's first global companies thanks to advancements in refrigeration. At one point, more meat was processed there than any other place in the world. In fact, on top of the meat, hundreds of byproducts were made there from animal feed to tennis racket strings and pharmaceuticals. These plants were an intricate network of hundreds of buildings full of livestock. 
50,000 people worked in the stockyards, including white collar workers whose headquarters were located right in the middle of the slaughter and processing buildings. The branch had plenty of ridership and saw little change for several decades. However, poor conditions and lax safety regulations led the Yards Branch to a harmful number of major fires. The largest fire occurred on December the 22nd and 23rd of 1910, just two years after the branch opened, resulting in the deaths of 21 firemen. It required over 50 fire companies to extinguish the flames. The L came away unscathed, but not for good. On May the 19th, 1934, another fire started in a haystack for the livestock. Flames erupted and jumped from pen to pen of dry grass and spread out throughout the yards and into the city. Multiple buildings were burnt down over three blocks, resulting in up to $8 million of property damage. Then, on August the 22nd, 1956, yet another fire broke out in the stockyards. This one was located in the southwest section of Packingtown, near Packers Station, and damaged elevated structures serving the loop. As a result, service was maintained to all stations, using the split loop as if they were two separate branches which ended up being very labor-intensive. Repairs were carried out on the L, now controlled by the CTA, but it was really all for nothing, as the stockyards themselves were in decline. Since 1924, the stockyards were falling apart. New technologies and federal highway systems, plus refrigeration trucks, allowed companies to move out of the expensive urban areas they previously relied on for railroad access. Now with bigger, better rural plants, they could deal with farmers directly, bypassing the need for stockyards. By the 1950s, every company, including Morris, Armour, and Swift, was ready to leave and the plants were closing down. With no more workers, ridership on the stockyard branch declined, making it hard to justify keeping around, especially as the CTA was cutting rides left, right, and center. Although they spent time and money restoring the loop after the fire of 1956, there wasn't enough revenue to sustain it with the number of riders that it was getting. So on October the 6th, 1957, the CTA discontinued all service to the stockyard branch and replaced the line with bus number 43. The stockyard itself struggled for another 15 years or so, but the landscape of the industry had changed so much that it slowly became more and more obsolete. It finally closed as well on July the 30th, 1971. It started to be redeveloped, sealing the fate of the stockyard branch. Today, the area has become an industrial park, home to various factories, none of which are meatpacking. All that remains of the once great stockyard branch are the street stubs of the elevated tracks, a concrete embankment where the branch split off, and several other fragments that would be very easy to overlook. In fact, if you want to commemorate the stockyards, it's best to focus on those giant limestone arches that marked where the entrance once was. The Chicago L, in all of its hiccups and closures, is truly a marvel. The fact that it came from multiple companies before it ultimately merged and came under city control makes it not just a testament to urban planning, but also a human advancement as a whole. Although it's admirable that the CRT wanted to keep every station it started with well expanding, the CTA ultimately made the right financial move by shutting down so many stations. And while they didn't have to demolish all of these stations, the closures certainly created the Chicago L that we know today. And we'll leave it there, but thank you for watching. And until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.